Hi, everyone. OK. So um, I'm going to be a little bit more narrow than what Emily said. Um, and in the interest of some folks, but I, want, I, will, I, I do want to start off with some big, uh, a, a few big picture ideas and a little bit more of an explanation. I know you, you all have been hearing a lot of different studies and from different parts of the world, some of them coordinated by IPA, some not. Um, but, but I want to I want to give you a little bit of an introduction or explanation of what IPA is, so you also have some context now. But first, I'm going to start off with um, a little broader discussion about the theory of savings. We talked about this a little bit earlier, and you've heard certainly a ton about savings. What we haven't really talked about is why why is this something that we are all sitting around the table talking about? Why isn't why aren't we holding a conference on rubber bands or paper or soda? You know, why do we think the world is under-consuming soda, under-consuming rubber bands? Right. So, what what is it about savings that we that we think needs a group of people like us, all kind of socially conscious? Some of us are coming at it from. A, perspective of an NGO, some of us coming at it from the perspective of a bank, but everybody here, I think there's one common theme, which is they're seeing financial services as a way to make the world a better place, but we're not also going to the rubber band conference where we think that rubber bands are making the world a better place necessarily. Not that I don't think it's rubber bands. Um, so what is it that we think is happening that is, that is a, a failure in the world that, we're, that we think we can improve. And, and that's actually, as an economist, oftentimes the way we start off thinking about any sort of problem is we start off. But, um, we start off by saying, well, the world works. Markets work. People can come together, make transactions, and, and everybody's better off. And then we start off by saying, we start off with that, and then our second point is to often say, well, maybe that's not always the case. And then when is it the case? Why, where is the market failure, to use the economist jargon, that is bringing us to the table as socially conscious people saying, I think there's something here that we can do to make the world a better place, either through business or nonprofit or regulatory policy. So, so in the spirit of savings, why is it that we think people should change their savings behavior? Why is this something or, or that firms should change the products that are offered so that people can then change their savings behavior likewise. What, what is it, you know, what's the theory in terms of where the problems are? And so thinking about it as these, these types of issues. But before I do that, let me just tell you one little um, anecdote, joke kind of point, which is sometimes people will say that under, you know, let me, let me put it this way. Suppose I ask you to all raise your hand if you would prefer to have more savings. Raise your hand if you'd like to have more savings right now. Is there anybody whose hand is not up? <laughs> Some people's hands were not up. I sense you weren't listening. <laughs> okay, so you know, there's one obvious way to increase savings, which is to increase income. Um, there is a there is one of my favorite lines ever from The Simpsons. Um, everyone familiar with The Simpsons with Homer Simpson and and um, and so and, and Montgomery Burns is like the really really rich billionaire in, in The Simpsons. And, the, and Homer turns to Montgomery Burns and says, Mr. Burns, you're the richest man I know. And Montgomery Burns turns back to Homer and says, yes, but I'd give it all but a moment for just a little bit more. <laughs> um, so, you know, when we talk about under savings, let's just get rid of some of the, you know, the easy stuff would just be say, yes, let's increase income and so people can have more savings. So what we're really talking about is given resources, fixing resources where they are, what, what are the issues, given the resources people have, that are leading them to not save as much as they would in a perfect world? And so here's a list of five. Some of them are more obvious than others. So first are transaction costs. We've seen clear, um, clear discussions and, and presentations talking about, for instance, mobile money being a, a transformational way of bringing down tra uh, transaction costs. So now, now, let's be clear, it doesn't mean that it's when someone doesn't have access to a bank because they live in a rural area and there's no, there's no brick and mortar place to put a, to put a savings, that, that they had no opportunity to save. It's just that their options for savings were, were not safe 
perhaps from theft, their option for saving. There's always the pocket. One always should always think about the pocket or the mattress as your outside option. Right? And so then everything we think about should always be compared to that. Right? And so that is you know, a potentially risky thing to use for savings is your pocket or your mattress because of theft. It certainly doesn't earn interest, right? uh, at least not my pockets. Um, maybe someone has a magic pocket, but most pockets do not pay interest. So, and most pockets have that problem of the, the, you know, burning a hole in your pocket, which gets to the behavioral biases I'm going to come to that. But just in terms of transaction costs, using a formal sector bank obviously has transaction costs if you have to travel to the bank. And in many places, using a bank account actually has fees attached to it. Not all places, there's a lot of variation across the world in this. Uh, but we have seen, for instance, in, in Kenya, the study that you heard um, Aaron present yesterday, one of the, the ways that they got people to open account was really simple. There used to be an $8 account opening fee, and they dropped it to zero. That alone led people to open the account. So that's, that's a good example where there was a very simple transaction cost to open the account that was cost prohibitive and led many people to, to not open it. The second is lack of trust in regulatory barriers. So maybe people trust their pocket or their mattress more than they trust the bank. Uh, you know, that, that is a clear role for regulatory policy to help protect consumers and, and make sure that banks stay um, engaged in prudent policies. But there's also a certain element there that is about marketing. Um, it is about how can firms present themselves better to clients in order to make them feel comfortable that they are a trustworthy entity, and hopefully that they are. Um, the third has to do with information and knowledge gaps. So this uh, pertains to many things that, you know, suppose that you're buying a shirt. And suppose, this, suppose it's a t-shirt, so it's a more of a commodity good. But you don't know every single price in the marketplace. So you sometimes might end up finding that you're overpaying for that shirt, simply because you didn't know that three blocks further there was a cheaper place to buy that same very shirt. Right? So you know, having information on prices is, a, is kind of an assumed thing in a perfect market, but in the real world, we don't always know all the prices all the time, and, and sometimes there's variation, and it costs money to get that information. Well, similarly, in the savings space, you could just think about it as it, it's, it's costly to acquire information about all the different financial services that are out there. And some people have, it's, for some people, it's cheaper than for others to acquire that information. Right? People who have been to school, who are more educated, can acquire that information more cheaply. They can read, read the documentation about savings accounts and loans and understand it better. They understand what an interest rate is better, so they're able to more quickly um, process that and decide whether it's a good thing or not. So these are the types of things that, when we're talking about information and knowledge gaps, that might exist. And that's actually one of the motivations, or one of the theories behind doing financial education. I'm not saying it's right, I'm saying that's the theory, is that there are these information and knowledge gaps, and that it's not profitable necessarily for banks to always fill in that gap and so there's a role for public world subsidies foundations government to provide um, better information and lower those <coughs> costs. Possible. A fourth is social constraints. Uh, I, I'm drawing a blank but I know we had um, one at least one presentation talking about that. I'm sorry. What's that? Many. Many. Um, it's one that I'm drawing a blank. Um, but, so you know, here's here's the simple story of people not saving because they don't think they're going to really get the benefits of the savings because someone else is going to come along and demand it from them before they can um, before they can spend it on what they want, really want to spend it on, and so they have a difficulty saying no to their cousin. And if the cousin can see the money and knows that it's there under the mattress, they're going to take it, and, um, and so they don't save in order to keep the money. And lastly are the behavioral biases that we've talked a lot about. Uh, time and consistency, attention are two of the ones that we're going to um, focus on in, and I'm going to focus on in, in the next bit. So these are all the, their various theories of why people might undersave. We can also put up a list of reasons why people might oversave. Uh, but we don't, we don't, a lot of the biases that we do observe tend to go one direction, but not all. There are certainly cases we could point to, if one could point to, that could, they could be predictors of oversaving, but that tends to be less of a concern from a public policy perspective. 
So IPA's approach has five prongs to it. But we don't always do all five. So let me put up the five. So there's the five prongs are innovate, evaluate, replicate, communicate, and scale. And what I'm going to now show you are three examples of projects that are in the three different phases of this spectrum. So innovate is when we are involved in, in just that, the innovation phase, trying to understand a potential idea and create an idea that is a potential solution. Not all of the projects that we engage in are like that. There's many projects we involve, we get engaged in, in which there's somebody else who's done the innovation, they've done the creative work, and we're just coming in and helping them document and understand, is this, is this working or not? What is the impact? Um, the first project I'm going to show you is in the innovation phase, um, and we're actually currently looking for partners for it. So the evaluate phase is almost always part of what IPA does. Now keep in mind that evaluation in some cases means the big question of does it work and what's the impact, but sometimes it's more micro operational questions of what marketing approach is going to work better to help generate take up? What interest rate is going to generate more usage of the savings account or the lending product, things of this nature? So sometimes it's more of a rapid fire evaluate question and sometimes it's a sit, you know, set something up and sit back and wait three years kind of question. Replicate goes right to one of the questions that, that, um, that Mark asked in the, in the discuss and roll in, when, in, in, in a couple panels ago, right? So, we need, and, and that's just one word up there, but if I wanted to expand it to be a little bit more descriptive of what I mean by this, I would say theory-based replication, right? It's not replication merely for the sake of replication. It's not that we do something once with a thousand people and we said we'll just need to do it again for another thousand. That's just increasing your sample size, which in many cases is a good thing, but that's not what we mean by replication. What we mean by replication is saying, well, we, you know, we really have a theory as to the context in which this is going to work and when it's not going to work, and we're going to test that theory across multiple contexts. Um, and and, and so, so this is something that is very much needed because really the goal for research should be to stop doing research. If that's not the eye of the prize at the end of the day, if that's not the goal, then something, something is wrong um, with, or with this style of research, I should say. Um, where you know, we want to get to the point where we can stand up tall and make policy prescriptions, not here's more research questions that you need to answer alongside everything you do. Which gets us to the communicate and scale. Now, you know, at no point in time, I mean, we, are, we are researchers, you're all, you're all heard lots of presentations from researchers now. And so we're all people that obviously have revealed ourselves to think that there's more questions to be asked that the world can benefit from, um, from answering, we want to play that role. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't mean the world needs to, can stop while researchers do what they need to do to find out these answers. So there's, there's always this, this in-between in which there's some lessons we've, we've learned. They do have some prescriptions to them. Some of them are stronger than others in terms of uh, their directive to change policy. And, and we always see, you know, there's the spectrum of where we are in a given space. And um, so one of the examples I'm gonna use in the communication and the scaling is on commitment savings, where I think we're further along the spectrum than we were five years ago. We have lots of solid evidence of actual changes at the household level, improvements in the way decisions get made, and improvements for the welfare of the children, things of this nature. And these are positive. It doesn't mean that we've answered all the questions that we think need to be answered in order to know how best to do this. But that's the example I'm going to use in the, in the communication and scale, where IPA is now getting active working with financial institutions to help scale up commitment savings accounts. And this means that if there's a situation where research was not applicable to do, we would still get engaged. But it does also mean that we will look out for opportunities to, to document things when, when it is possible. And there are some situations where we have gone beyond the research altogether and we're just doing things. Um, the deworming of school children is the example that I gave yesterday that fits into that bill. We have large projects that are, that are not doing randomized trials on that, that are just working with the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, to um, implement school-based deworming programs. Okay, so, um, so, going, so let me give you the example of innovation. So one of the issues in, in, in um in financial services that I think is, is relevant. And in a broad-based way of describing it is, we see a world which is very product-focused, 
not client focused. We see this, we've seen this shift in some other parts of the world. There's many, many financial services firms in the United States I can point to that I would say think of themselves as being client focused. And the difference is it's not about designing a particular product and then just pushing it out and then doing this three or four times. But it's about thinking about what clients need and trying to think about what, what is the suite of financial services that is most appropriate um, for an individual. And how do you then get individuals into the right suite of financial products? So the example I want to use for this is something we're calling offset accounts. So here's an example of product selling gone amok. If someone is borrowing, suppose you have a loan right now from a, from an organ, from a lender lending to you at 50% annualized interest. It's not an incredibly high interest rate from a microfinance organization. That's a standard interest rate. And so, and so you, have this, you have this loan, and now you have some extra cash on your hand. What's the optimal thing for you to do? Should you save that money and put it in a bank account, earning, say, 3%? Or should you pay down your loan early so that you aren't paying interest of 50% on, on that money, that, that extra money that you have? Hopefully everybody is thinking, well, it's kind of obvious, we need to pay down the loan earlier, right? Because that's a 47% difference in interest that I can earn by paying down my loan earlier um, and not keeping money earning 3% while I'm paying this guy over here 50% and getting paid 3% for, for the same money. But if we're in a world in which banks are both promoting credit and promoting savings to the same person, not, saying, not pointing out to them that actually I, I, you really ought to do one or the other, but not both, then this is exactly an example where public policy, which is pushing credit for people and pushing savings for people, can actually lead to, to is, is not a good thing. Right? And this is, you know, it's not to say every single person is going to use it this way, but if that is being done, that is not in the client's best interest. So an offset account, is an account which tries to think about the client's portfolio as just that, a portfolio, and say, well, you know, you might be someone who at some point in time wants to be in debt, and other points in time need to be a saver. But we're not gonna make you do both at the same time. This has been done in the United Kingdom, but with much smaller spreads, because mortgages there are much cheaper. And we're now looking for partners to test this in developing countries, where the issue, I think, is much more stark, because the spread is much higher. And, and the way it works is, is fairly simple, which is that the bank treats the client as, um, treats their portfolio as one, and says, look, we're gonna pay you on your net savings, or you're gonna pay us on your net borrowing, whichever one you're in. If you're a net borrower, then that's fine. If you've, if you've saved 100 and borrowed 500, that means you're a net borrower of 400. We're gonna charge you interest on 400. If you've saved 1,000 and you're borrowing 800, that means you're a net saver of 200. So we're just gonna pay you interest on the 200, and that's it. So it's just saying, you know, you might, you might be presented like you have these two accounts, so that you can have the comfort and the psychological benefits of feeling like you have the savings account. Um, and you might want the loan for the discipline of having to pay back a loan. But we're not actually going to have two accounts behind the scenes in the way we actually handle your portfolio. We're going to recognize that if you're borrowing and saving with the same financial institution, that you're, one of those two is being done to a larger scale, and that's really what you're effectively doing. And so this is an account which basically um, gives people the psychological benefits that they may want from having the separation. But in practice, the finances of it are what's in the client's best long-term interest. So what's the challenge with this? This is very simple. This is this is at, I, we don't, I don't know, I can't stand up to you and tell you for a fact that this is going to work in the long run. What I can tell you is there's a clear trade-off for the financial institution. In the long run, the benefit is that you're, what you're doing is unambiguously better for the client. Better for them financially, provides them psychologically potentially what they need, um, and, and they spend less money on financial services. So you might end up with a much more loyal client who's with you for a very long time and brings in lots of other people as client referrals because, because you're giving them a better product. What's the cost? Well, if you were lending to them at 50% and having them save you with 3%, that was very profitable for you. You were making a lot of money off of their mistake and you're giving up that profit that you were making on their mistake. 
So that's a short-term cost to the financial institution in exchange for a potential long-term gain. What's the net effect? I don't know, that's why I'm a researcher. <laughs> I can't just pose the questions. But this is the innovation that we'd like to test. We've seen it done at much smaller spreads, and, and we're very actively looking for, for partners on this. Um, okay. Um, so the second one I wanted to talk about was the replication projects on reminders. And then here I just want to give a, a series of the types of questions that we're asking on this. And I think one of the, this is an example of one of the, one of the settings where there's just a really easy or low cost way of, uh, of, of running experiments that has the advantage that, and I, and I put my own work very much in the spirit of this that you've heard me present, just, you know, we, we put up these tests and I show you that like, okay, we had two treatments and a control, and we're obviously leaving a lot of questions on the table that are very difficult to answer with two treatments and a control or three treatments and a control. And, and so, you know, each one of these is like building blocks that's slowly building a picture. And with very large interventions that are very heavy handed with product designs on savings accounts, it's very hard to get more complicated in the research design. But one of the advantages of the communication channels, text, text messages, is that we can get much more complicated without, uh, without actually complicating any one instance. And so this is why we've chosen this as a, as a vehicle for setting up a large set of replication studies with many different partners, where each one partner might only engage in three or four tests. Um, but when we put the whole body together, each partner gets to benefit from all of the learning from all the other partners. As a, as a kind of club doing this, and then also hopefully what we, what we aim for is to be able to put together kind of white papers and product manuals that can go to other institutions that we're not part of the research at all, who can learn from the, the 10 organizations that we do work closely with about what's really working and what's not, and what are the context, and how do you segment your market um, to figure out what type of messaging to send to what type of clients, et cetera. So here are some basic things um, that are, we're working on. Um, and there's, there's some very practical questions, and some of these are more theory-based about decision-making. Um, so one is about technology and just understanding more about, uh, you know, there are some choices to be made about how text messaging is sent that we need to work out um, and, and see how, how easily it can get integrated in with the computer systems of micro-lenders and micro-saving firms um, in order to, um, to make the data be as, as responsive as possible. Um, the more theoretical question we're interested in from a behavioral, academic, and psychological perspective is what is the exact mechanism through which reminders are affecting behavior? Is it about task management? Is it about reminding people about future expenses? Is it informative? Is it, is it that it's not about attention, but it's actually about people who, who don't have really good information about, about what types of financial um, behaviors are the, they should engage in or they don't think they do? And they get this kind of message from the bank, which they respect, and they respect the bank's opinion, and they see these messages as being informative to them about what a good behavior is to do. And so we're not, we're not, these reminders are not actually reminding people, they're actually informing people. Um, and so that, that's a possibility, and that can be tested by using different content within the message. If it is about habit formation, then the timing in which it's sent, the task management should matter a lot. The time of day in which it's sent might matter. The frequency, the length of the message, the variety of the message, all these things may matter. Um, and then also, you can very imagine very different um, rule effectiveness for different types of financial, uh, financial tasks one needs to do. Savings versus loans being one easy and obvious differentiation. One, one, one sense in which um, saving, there's two senses in which savings are really greatly disadvantaged to, to credit, both when it comes to savings. One is, a bank will come and remind you to repay your loan if you don't. A bank's not gonna come and remind you to save if you haven't. That's not what banks do. Um, a second is that you can forget about the fact that you have access to credit. And, and then when you need access to credit, go and get a loan. For most people, in most settings. You can't forget about the need to save and then show up at the bank and make your savings, right? It's not there, you didn't save. So, so in, 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 two, in, two, in both of those senses, loans have a bit of a salience advantage 
That doesn't mean, though, that there's not perhaps some role for it. We found in the Philippines, in, a te in one experiment on text messaging, that um, reminding people to repay their loans did actually increase loan repayments, but only when the loan, the text message, included the name of the bank officer. So the message sent was, if I was the bank officer, it said, hi, this is Dean from First Mountain Attack Bank, reminding you to make your loan payment. That worked. If I just said, hi, this is First Mountain Attack Bank, reminding you to make your loan, that did not work. So this actually, that's just one study. I don't want to go nuts in terms of like, like lessons for the world, but that does have a very clear lesson to it about the, the, the personal relationship um, that is potentially very important. And that as we see mobile banking take off, we see less and less need for the human interaction, the human interface between the bank and the client. And that might actually have negative ramifications for loan repayment, which then will have negative ramifications for ability to get people loans, because if there's lots of default, interest rates will go up, um, and this would be bad, right? So, so this does have an, uh, an important implication that as we use mobile money to expand access to financial services, we, we might want to think about how to still maintain that human interface um, so that we don't see, um, so that people still feel a little more of a human connection to whoever's giving them that loan. Okay, so then the, the last to talk about is on the scaling side and the commitment savings work. So this is an example where there's more, there's, there's more evidence on commitment savings and its effectiveness. It doesn't always work. I showed you an example yesterday of two different commitment savings accounts. One that was really strongly, uh, had a really strong commitment where st students had to spend the money on education and the other was a looser commitment where they were simply encouraged and nudged to spend it on savings, um, I'm sorry, on education. And that the strong one did not work. So it's not to say that just because you throw the word commitment in front of a savings account, it's gonna, it's gonna work and we need to scale this up. There's clearly lessons about how to do it and there's gonna be different answers for different types of needs and different flows. And so there's, there's still more work that needs to be done to provide that kind of guidebook to, to banks and financial institutions about how to, how to roll these out, what terms and conditions to offer, and how to market them. But the evidence that we've seen so far in many different countries is, is quite promising, from Kenya to the Philippines, where we've seen evidence of higher income from people as they're able to save up the study that Aaron presented to a study in the Philippines I did where we saw women get more power in the household and then spend more of their money from the extra power that they did have on household durables that were for, for building the household. So there's some really important changes that we have seen happen at the household level that are more than just mere increase in savings, where we've actually seen changes in, in real behavior and real outcomes. So this is very promising, and so this is in that space where we refer to it I think, as the scale-up phase, but we're, we're really just getting started with it, and like I said, I wouldn't consider this to be outside the space of research. So as an example, I think there's three different categories of things that are really important to, in terms of the terms and conditions, and then there's a second category about self-awareness that I would leave as the, some of the most important open questions. So first of all, when we say commitment, we mean what are we actually saying? Is it a commitment to make deposits, to not withdraw, or to spend on certain items? These are three different, very, very different things, and we need to figure out better how to design products that, that, that hit that right balance between these. And depending on what the issue is that is making a commitment product uh, a good thing, we would have different answers to these three. The other is self-awareness. How do we help people become self-aware so that they sign up for the accounts when they're good for them and they don't sign up for them if they don't have an issue? We don't, what we don't want to see is people locking up their money and then not having access to it and then taking out loans because they don't have access to the, to the cash that they did have before. That's a bad thing. So we need to figure out how to help people become self-aware so that they opt into it when it's, when it's optimal for them and they don't when they don't. And that's, that's something which uh, I don't think there has been enough work on on that topic, and I think it's an important area that we can see more, more exploration of this um, as we see these scale up. So all three of these are looking for partners, um, and so you know, please come and, um, please come and you know, part of their goal with these types of events is obviously a lot of sharing of results so people can learn and implement from lessons learned, 
but also it's about matchmaking. Lots of researchers here, um, lots of people from IPA, and there's lots of opportunities um, to come and, and, and talk with people and, and, and meet each other and, and hopefully get some, get some more of these exciting projects going that are changing the way financial services are done, but doing it alongside careful documentation so that others can learn. So I will close with that. And thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been a real pleasure to talk with people here today. Thank you.